Will AI robots get so smart that they look to exterminate us or turn us into pets? Tesla founder Elon Musk says that AI is humanity's biggest existential threat and that it poses a fundamental risk to the existence of civilization. The late renowned physicist Stephen Hawking said it could spell the end of the human race. I got very frustrated with that kind of fear-inducing hype because it's a huge overstatement of AI capabilities by pundits and vendors. You're listening to Retail Remix, your inside access to candid conversations with the people shaping retail's future. Here's your host, Alicia Esposito. AI is a fascinating area of the retail tech landscape. And I'll be honest, I've written about AI at a high level, but I'm certainly no expert. I feel like there are so many layers to the technology, how it works, how it can be applied throughout retail businesses, and that these applications can and will have a profound impact on us as humans. And I wanted to fully understand this story because we've seen such an acceleration of new technologies, new trends, new innovations, that I couldn't help but feel like AI would be rising to the top in some way in 2021. That's why I really wanted to sit down with Steve Schwartz, author, AI researcher, and entrepreneur, to get into some of these details. And he actually has a new book, Evil Robots, Killer Computers, and Other Myths, The Truth About AI and the Future of Humanity. So, I mean, who better else to break all of this down for me? So we get into the big picture, the societal implications of AI, but also some of the nitty gritty retail stuff, how it can be applied across the retail organization, what challenges or obstacles retail executives need to be on the lookout for, and most importantly, what strategic questions and considerations you need to take into account if you want to capitalize on the potential of AI in the future. Dr. Stephen Schwartz, so good to have you on the show. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Nice to be here, Alicia. Thanks for inviting me. So you have an expansive history and career in AI. It's super fascinating and exciting, and I'm sure there's a lot you can teach me. But first, I would love to hear about how this career has evolved over the years and kind of what your day in the life looks like today. Sure. So I started my career in artificial intelligence way back in 1979, when I moved to Connecticut to do postdoctoral research with one of the pioneers of AI, Roger Shank at Yale University. In the 1980s, I co-founded three AI companies, one of which had a public offering and another one became one of the leading business intelligence products of the 1990s. Then in 2000, I led the investor round, was a board member, and later took an operational role at a company named Tango, which we grew from zero to 200 million. And and that was the sixth best IPO of 2011. After Tango, I retired for the second time, but met my co-founder in Device 42, who had such a good idea for a product that I unretired again and ended up working for six or seven years to build that business, which was acquired last year. And since then, I've been working on writing the book and on AI, and that's going to be published by Fast Company Press on February 9th of 2021. Yeah, super exciting. We're going to get into the book in a little bit, but I'm really curious, what about AI initially grabbed your attention and interest? Because, I mean, it's clear you've dedicated your life's work to this space. What initially caught your attention and what continues to drive your passion? You just noted that you came out of retirement to to build another business. So, I mean, what about this space really, really grabs you? Yeah. So, I've always been fascinated by the idea of programming computers and robots to have human level intelligence, to build computers and robots that truly understand language and can think and reason like people. But I pretty much gave up on that idea in the, in the late 1980s. It was just too hard. Today's incarnation of AI is very different. Today's incarnation of AI has had tremendous success. We can build AI programs that recognize faces in our photos, 
that translate language when we're traveling abroad, and many more capabilities that we used to think were only possible via real intelligence. However, these new AI programs have virtually no intelligence under the hood. But still, I find this new incarnation of the field fascinating because it's generating real important applications that are changing our society, even if they don't have the level of intelligence that we were trying to get to back in the 1980s. Yeah, and there are definitely some really exciting applications, especially in retail. But before we get too deep into those applications, the use cases, I'm sure there are a few folks listening like myself that know of AI, they've read about it, they've heard about it, but maybe don't quite understand the full nuts and bolts of it. And I know there are some key facts or major types of AI. So can you kind of break down at a high level, I guess, the Reader's Digest of AI as much as you can so we can understand like the bare bones of it? Sure. I'm going to give you a high level explanation of a couple of technical terms. There are two major types of AI. One is known as machine learning, and the other one is known as natural language processing. Machine learning is really an evolved form of what we used to call statistics. I used to teach statistics in the late 1970s at Towson University in Baltimore. And today's machine learning is an evolution of statistics with far better computational capabilities and taking advantage of the massive computer power we have today and the massive amount of data that's been generated by use of the internet. And machine learning, that first type of AI, is responsible for most of the major inventions that you hear about in AI. Machine learning is responsible for facial recognition, recognizing our photos, and machine translation, speech recognition, and many other of the amazing things that have come out of AI. The other type of AI, natural language processing, is the technology that enables us to talk to our smartphones. Got it. Yeah. And and I know just in my everyday life and especially covering retail, I've definitely heard those terms before, definitely have seen them used in context of new applications that are making the customer experience better, easier, more personalized for shoppers, which allows us to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what you think is kind of most exciting in AI right now. I mean, this could be broad or retail specific. I mean, are there any new developments or applications that you're seeing like the full potential of AI being materialized and you think it's especially promising right now? Sure. So Alicia, I think the single most impactful event in artificial intelligence was the application of machine learning technology to computer vision in 2012. Machine learning created the ability for computers and robots to quote unquote see. And as a result, we can now use machine learning to create programs that recognize objects. This is what's led to our smartphones being able to automatically label our photos and to self-driving cars that we're just starting to see come out This is what enables self-driving cars to quote unquote see pedestrians in the road. And the applications of this one capability is impacting business, government, organization, the retail sector. It's impacting everything. You know, just another example, doctors are using the technology to help them read MRIs and diagnose diseases. And machine vision is exciting and it's impacting society in a, in a very positive way, but it also has some questionable social impacts. There are also applications with questionable social impacts. For example, the military is using the capability. They're sending out weapons that can see and recognize buildings or terrorists or whatever on their own using this computer vision technology. And that's kind of a scary acceleration of military weaponry. Additionally, facial recognition has proven to be discriminatory and can be used by governments and law enforcement to invade our privacy. So, for example, in China, the Chinese government has linked up almost every camera in the country, security cameras, to a central capability 
where they can see what almost everybody is doing 24-7. They've even used it to catch people stealing toilet paper. Yeah. No, there's definitely some deep social implications that we're probably going to get into when we, we talk about your book. But first, I mean, computer vision broadly, like you said, is, is hitting a diverse range of industries, businesses. It's impacting us at an individual level. So what does that kind of look like since you've identified computer vision as the most exciting or the area of AI that has the most potential? What kind of applications are you seeing through a retail lens? Is it through that ability to be able to identify and understand people in the store connected to their digital footprints or fingerprints, so to speak? I mean, what type of use cases and applications in the retail world do you find most exciting and maybe even most promising for businesses, especially right now since we're in the midst of a pretty turbulent time in a retail lens? So, I mean, what what are your thoughts on that? You've hit the nail right on the head, Alicia. The use of computer vision in retail is exploding. For example, stores are using the technology to identify customers and essentially look over their shoulders and analyze their behavior. So they can train a camera. A customer comes into the field of the camera. They can figure out who that customer is. They can look up in their database what that customer has bought before. They can look at what that customer is looking at in the store. The computer vision system can see a customer pick up an item and put it back or pick up an item and put it in their shopping cart. So this enables store managers and corporate headquarters to really analyze both customer behavior in the aggregate and individual customer behavior. And obviously technology like that can be used for theft control, which is very important in retail. Another area that's impacting retail is delivery. We're starting to see self-driving vehicles that can make deliveries. In other words, vehicles without drivers. We see there are these tiny autonomous sidewalk delivery vehicles that some companies are, are testing and using to make deliveries. They look like small ice chests on wheels with vision sensors so they can navigate down the sidewalk, not bump into people, not bump into objects. And we're seeing larger, but still small, self-driving vehicles on city streets, starting to deliver things like pizzas. So you'll see a, a small vehicle, no driver, drive down the street, the person in their apartment or their house gets a text, your pizza's out here, the driver comes out, the delivery vehicle recognizes the smartphone, opens up the side of the vehicle, hands the user the pizza, and the pizza person goes in and eats the pizza. So that's that's like uh, Star Wars technology, and it's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I know Amazon acquired the autonomous driving startup Zooks, I think it was this summer. And I know the jury's still out and like what that acquisition will bring, what the plans are there, but it definitely showed that Amazon, you know, this company that's always a few steps ahead of the broader industry is kind of putting their their stake in the ground and saying, you know, this is an area of investment. And, and, and I guess it kind of connects to what's happening now. I'm glad you brought up the delivery and fulfillment side because that is very top of mind right now for a lot of retailers. Like, how can we make that safer, more efficient, and ultimately more effective for our customers? So definitely very interesting stuff. Absolutely. And, and Amazon is also using that computer vision technology in their warehouses to stock shelves. And the company they bought, Zooks, has some impressive self-driving videos. If you go out onto YouTube and, and look up Zooks, you, you can see videos of a self-driving car driving around San Francisco. Very, very impressive. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's something like the way they can drive, right? Like they go forwards and backwards, like they can get in small spaces. So we'll definitely be uh, interested. We'll include that in the show notes if people are interested in, in learning more about that. But we're talking about the positive impact, the potential of AI. But of course, you made reference to the negative impact. And that's kind of the heart of your book in a nutshell, right? Evil robots, killer computers, and other myths, the truth about AI and the future of humanity, which I have to say probably perfectly 
summarizes the conversation around AI in general. So good on you and your editor for really nailing that. But I have to ask, why did you think a book like this was needed? And most of all, what were you hoping to accomplish with this book? What type of benefits were you hoping to bring to the conversation around AI? Yeah, great question. I love answering that question, Alicia. So AI has made great strides from an engineering perspective. Siri answers our questions. Google Translate helps us talk to taxi drivers in foreign lands and so on. And all that progress that when we seemingly have intelligent computers naturally leads people to wonder where it will all end. Will AI robots get so smart that they look to exterminate us or turn us into pets? Tesla founder Elon Musk says that AI is humanity's biggest existential threat and that it poses a fundamental risk to the existence of civilization. The late renowned physicist Stephen Hawking said it could spell the end of the human race. I got very frustrated with that kind of fear-inducing hype because it's a huge overstatement of AI capabilities by pundits and vendors. And that's what spurred me to write this book. In my book, I explain why AI systems are not going to become intelligent enough to have the ability to exterminate us. They're not going to become intelligent enough to turn us into pets, and they're not going to be intelligent enough to take all our jobs. And I at least tried to write it in such a way that, that people with no technology background will understand why that's true and when they get done with the book to be able to explain why that's not true to their friends and colleagues. Yeah. No, I think it's a great point. And I'm so glad that the future of humanity was brought up in the title because anytime AI comes up from an editorial perspective, the underlying narrative is machines versus humans and will the machines replace the humans? The, the conversation around the workforce. And, you know, I'm glad we, we talked about Amazon earlier because I think they're a really strong example of high investment in technology and AI driven tech, but still there is a strong investment in the workforce. So can we take a little bit deeper into that topic through a retail lens? Because you did just say, you know, that that whole we're going to become robots, pets is not going to not going to happen. So what are the key takeaways as to like why that's not going to be happening anytime soon? Sure. So essentially what's happened with machine learning, which is the biggest technology that's created some of these amazing capabilities. These are technologies that can learn to do one and only one thing. So a piece of AI that can recognize and name faces and photos can't tell the difference between a dog and a cat and certainly can't translate languages. And what's actually happening under the hood is that these are all one trick ponies. These AI systems can only do one thing and nobody knows how to extend them past doing that one thing into you know real common sense reasoning like people use and real processing of language. So you know on the language side, it seems like you have smartphones that can understand you and respond to you, but systems like Siri and Alexa essentially work by having giant lookup tables of things people can say. And in those lookup tables for everything they can say, there's an entry in the lookup table that contains an exact response that the smartphone just parrots back to the user. So this makes it seem like the smartphone understands language, but they're really just looking up what the user said and parroting back a canned response. Got it. Yeah, so there needs to be some sort of human element or human driver to what makes AI so powerful. So, I mean, that's kind of the big elephant in the room, so to speak, around AI. But what other myths or even misconceptions about AI exist in whether it's media or in business conversations that may be preventing us from realizing its potential value or a positive impact? Is there anything that's essentially holding us back, I guess, from digging deeper into AI? Yeah, I think there are. 
I'm going to give you four of my favorite myths. So number one, and we already talked about this a little, that AI is going to be smart enough to take over the world. We waste a lot of time and effort worrying about and figuring out how to deal with something that just isn't going to happen. There's also danger that by worrying about these AI systems that might exterminate us or turn us into pets, that governments will restrict AI and that progress will be limited due to this fictional possibility. But we won't see those intelligent machines in our lifetimes, probably not in our children's lifetimes and probably not in their children's lifetimes. Number two, the myth is that AI is going to take all our jobs. One idea of AI is that if AI can read books and take classes and understand books and classes, it can learn every job and there won't be any jobs left for people. Well, that's just not happening. Nobody has any idea how to make AI read books or take classes and understand them well enough to do someone's job. What's really going to happen is that AI will take some jobs, just like technology automation has taken jobs over the last 200 years. It will also create some jobs. But actually, AI won't take any more jobs than conventional software. And in fact, I would argue that conventional software has been and will continue to take many more jobs than AI. Number three, the idea that self-driving cars are going to dominate our roads within the next 10 years. Yes, we'll see some very limited rollouts of self-driving cars. We may see self, some self-driving taxis in cities, self-driving delivery vehicles. But 10 years from now, most cars and trucks on our highways and streets are still going to be driven by people. And number four, and I, I just mentioned this one, I, I don't want to repeat it, is the idea that AI can understand language. It really can't. Siri and Alexa just look up what the user said and parrot back a canned response. Got it. Some great points there. And I, I do want to kind of dig into the societal implications that we've kind of brought up organically over the course of our conversation. So this notion of bias in AI, and also I immediately, when I hear about AI, I think about social algorithms and how intelligent that they're getting. Um, there have been a lot of conversations in the marketing world around how algorithms kind of put us into our own social media echo chamber. And it's just a repetitive hit of like our own established biases and beliefs and, and you know, the spread of misinformation and disinformation. So that, that's like one, I guess, subtopic in this bigger conversation around AI and, and algorithms specifically. But let's dig into some of the other underlying implications of AI that possibly need to address need to be addressed, what dangers we need to be on the lookout for. Again, I know we kind of talked about some of like the government level stuff earlier, but is there anything for retail specifically that you think is important to note here? Well, I think retail is, is going to be impacted by the regulations and whatever companies decide to do about some of these technologies. Let's take facial recognition as an example. So facial recognition has, we already talked about it, is starting to have a big impact in retail. But facial recognition can be discriminatory. I'm going to give you an example. The ACLU did a study in which they ran a set of members of Congress through Amazon's facial recognition technology to see if it identified any of them as terrorists. And it actually identified 28 of them as terrorists, which is disturbing in and of itself, what was really disturbing was that 40% of the Congress people they identified as terrorists were people of color, where Congress itself is only 20% people of color. So that's big time discrimination. And there, there are under, underlying technical reasons why that's happening. And one thing that's happened is that Amazon and Microsoft and Google have decided not to sell facial recognition technology, at least to law enforcement. But it's still discriminatory. Even in a retail setting, it could be considered discriminatory if it identifies theft unequitably or if it doesn't do as good a job of recognizing people as color and they don't get as good recommendations. There are a lot of implications for retail when you look at these high-level 
AI issues. So one of those issues is discrimination, both in terms of facial recognition and in terms of systems that make decisions about whether somebody should get a loan or a or a mortgage. Another one is employment that we've talked about. There's a lot of concern about the impact of AI on employment. And AI will, like other technologies, take some jobs, both in retail and elsewhere. And as a society, it's a big deal when people lose their jobs. It's one of the worst things that can happen to a person. And as a society, we need to find a better way of of retraining people who lose their jobs, whether it's to AI, to conventional software, to some other kind of technology automation. We talked a little bit about privacy. I don't think anybody in the United States wants to live in a world where every camera is connected to a, a central government headquarters where they're monitoring everything we do. But are people in stores going to be happy about being monitored by the cameras that are watching them? It's one thing to have a camera that only comes into play if there's an incident and then you go and review the security footage. But when it's actively monitoring you and everything you're doing and everything you're looking at, our customers in retail stores are going to be accepting of that. So there are a lot of implications like those that we're going to have to deal with as, as a society and in our retail businesses. Yeah. So is it fair to say then that addressing some of these implications or I guess threats, you could say, there are multiple tiers and multiple parties kind of involved in ensuring that we keep these threats in check and that AI is being used as a source of value and good, so to speak, versus, you know, kind of making us kind of fall victim to these threats? Like I'm thinking like, is it a security and like policy issue? I'm sure there are business level implications and even us as like individuals, like what we do, the technology we engage with. I mean, like what needs to be done to kind of keep everything in check, I guess is, is the biggest question. Yeah, I think you said it right. It's multi-level. There are many issues that governments need to look at regulating. The use of facial recognition in law enforcement and retail is an example. We're going to need some regulations eventually, but at the same time, consumers are going to vote with their feet. So what's going to happen to uh, the first retail business that starts doing really significant surveillance of its customers with computer vision technology and word gets out on social media and it goes viral and nobody wants to shop in that store anymore. So yeah, it's happening on both levels. You've also, you also have academics who are banding together and refusing to work on certain types of technology. So it's a multi-level problem and a very interesting one and a critical one for society. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with tech evolving as rapidly as it is now. I know a big topic of conversation for us over the past, oh my God, how long has it been now? Like eight months now, ever since you know COVID has, we, we saw this acceleration of technology adoption on the consumer side and then also on the business side, the need to embrace innovative technology to keep business moving, right? Whether that's in the form of backend operations in the supply chain or customer facing, right? So everyone just kind of rushing to implement technologies to enable these experiences that will allow them to not just stay afloat, but maybe in some cases differentiate. So I guess my next question for you is around where you think AI is headed over the next year. Do you think that retailers will experience this acceleration of AI adoption and and usage, especially as they face the need to adapt and keep things moving and in line with consumer needs and behaviors? I mean, where, where do you think, how do you think this space will evolve over the next year? Yeah, I think it'll be a bit of a roller coaster. I do think we're going to see a lot of rush to deploying technology and then some degree of consumer backlash. The area that I worry about at most is in self-driving vehicles because no one knows how to make a self-driving car that can think and reason. And there are lots of edge cases that people encounter when they drive. So you see somebody swerving and you worry about if they're intoxicated. You see it's 32 degrees out and 
it's been raining and you start worrying about black ice. Well, computers can't think like that. They either have to be programmed for specific situations or not. And how can these self-driving cars be programmed for every eventuality that we run into as, as people? So I'm very worried that those edge cases will cause accidents and even, even more than accidents, they'll cause traffic jams. Just an example, sorry if I'm getting a little bit off track. Last year in Moscow, they had a driverless car competition where they had 300 driverless cars at the starting line. And what happened was one car had a mechanical issue at a stoplight and all the self-driving cars behind it just waited for that car to go. Now people would realize that there's a mechanical problem and, and eventually drive around it, but it resulted in a three hour traffic jam in, in Moscow. And I'm worried that we're gonna, the more we see with self-driving cars, the more we'll see of those traffic jams and, and even worse accidents. And I think in retail, we're gonna see the same thing with computer vision technology. So we'll implement a lot of monitoring and then there'll be the kinds of backlashes that we talked about and retailers will scramble to undo it and apologize and get back into the good graces of their customers. Excellent. This has been truly fascinating, Steve. Thank you again so much for taking the time out, kind of walking me through what you're seeing in this space, because you live and breathe this every day. You you study this intently. You literally wrote the book on it, several books on it. So it's always interesting to hear what people so close to like a certain tech trend find important or interesting, or in, in this case, full of potential, especially for retail right now. So to kind of put a bow on our conversation, I would love for you to provide any closing recommendations for the executives listening right now that are really trying to understand the full value proposition of AI for their business and not just whether they should be investing in it, but how they should be investing in it because there is so much going on. So I would love for you to, to share any closing points or recommendations for them that are trying to, they're trying to navigate this space as efficiently and effectively as possible. Sure. That's a really important question. So companies are using AI to gain competitive advantage and companies who ignore AI risk falling behind. This is true for large and small organizations. It's true for retail and other business sectors. That said, businesses shouldn't expect to go out and hire a team of AI experts and expect them to transform their business. What will happen is the AI experts won't know enough about your business or your data to make an impact. So you'll need people from the business who understand what data is available to point the AI experts in the right direction. So you need to put together a team of business people, data people, and AI people. The business and data people will have to learn enough about AI to have an idea of what it can and can't do. The AI members of the team will need to learn as much as they can about the business. Then as ideas start to get generated, the AI team can analyze the technical feasibility and the business and data people can analyze the business impact. Actually, it sounds a lot like how conventional software is developed, and it's exactly like that. Awesome. Dr. Steven Schwartz, again, thank you so much for taking the time out. It was a real pleasure to meet you and get your take on everything that's happening in this space. Again, The Truth About AI and the Future of Humanity, your new book, very exciting. We'll be sure to share a link to the book so people can learn more and hopefully buy a copy. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you again so much for uh, taking the time out today. I enjoyed it, Alicia. Thanks for having me. And to all of you listening out there, we hope you found this conversation fascinating, even valuable. If you have any follow-up questions for Dr. Steven Schwartz, please drop us a line on Twitter at our touch points. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast. It'll help you ensure that you get updated episodes as soon as they're available. We'll be having plenty more conversations like this, digging into the latest and greatest technology. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of Retail Remix. Be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on your favorite podcast player. Until next time, keep mixing it up.